Okay, greetings everyone. I'm Professor David Bilch. It's from the University of Johannesburg and the University of Reading. And I'm delighted to be chairing this book launch of Victoria Miandazi's book, Equality in Kenya's 2010 Constitution, Understanding the Competing and Interrelated Conceptions. This launch was put together as part of a collaboration between the South African Institute for Advanced Constitutional Public Human Rights and International, SIFAC, a center of the University of Johannesburg, and the Bonavera Institute of Human Rights at the University of Oxford. I would like to thank Professor Kate O'Regan for the central role she played in putting together this launch, as well as the staff of the Bonavera Institute, Merlin, Gayathri, and SIFAC for managing the administrative side and the marketing. Victoria Miandazi's work involves an in-depth exploration of the approach to equality in Kenya's constitution. The work engages in some depth, depth with both the leading legal thinking around equality globally and also situates the discussion of Kenya in a comparative context. The work engages with the current case law of the Kenyan courts, but also suggests how it should be developed. It is a rich work which engages a range of debates surrounding equality, these include issues surrounding affirmative action, the clash between culture, religion, and equality, and refreshingly, an engagement with the role equality can play in the advancement of socioeconomic rights. Victoria will shortly provide you with a more detailed outline of some of the key arguments of the book for those who have not yet read it. And I highly recommend that you do purchase it and the details will be provided to you in the chat and in the various, and the various links provided, as well as a discount code uh, for those participating in the seminar, I think you can get a 20% discount. Thereafter, we will have responses from an outstanding panel of experts in the field of equality. Now, to allow us to proceed to the substance quickly, I'm only going to briefly introduce our various panelists now, and more details of their biography can be found on the Bonavera website relating to this event. Victoria Miandazi, our author, is a law lecturer at the University of Embu, an associate advocate at Okubuasu, Munene and Kazungu Advocates, and a former researcher at the Oxford Human Rights Hub. She mainly teaches and writes on equality law, human rights, constitutional law, administrative law, property law, and comparative law, and we'll hear more about her work now on equality. Numfundo Ramalekana is a lecturer in the public law department at the University of Cape Town, where she teaches constitutional law. She has a default in law at the University of Oxford, and her default is on affirmative action in South Africa, which we hope soon, Nomfunda, to be launching as a book. Tarunab Keitan is the head of research at the Bonavera Institute of Human Rights and professor of public law and legal theory at the Faculty of Law at the University of Oxford. He is also a professor and future fellow at Melbourne Law School, working on a project on the res resilience of democratic constitutions with a focus on South Asia. He has written an award-winning monograph on the subject of equality titled A Theory of Discrimination Law. I highly recommend you purchase that too. Elisha Zebedi Ongoya is a teacher and practitioner of law. He is a senior lecturer in the Department of Public Law at Kabarak University in Kenya, where he has previously served as a head of department and the dean. He's also a principal partner at Ongoya and Wambola Advocates, a law firm based in Nairobi, Kenya. So I will now uh, hand over to Victoria for an outline of the book's core arguments. Please just note that the Q&A tab, which is over there, uh, you'll see uh, is, should be used to, uh, uh, you, can, you can put any questions or comments you want during the discussion or during the presentations, and we will have some time for questions right at the end after the presentations. So we're looking forward to an engaging discussion. Over to you, Victoria. Thank you for that, David. Um, it was a really good uh, introduction, especially with regards to the book. Uh, and again, uh, just to begin, I'd like to thank Bonavero and uh, SciFact for organizing this. And uh, also for the panelists who are going to be here, they're, they're quite um, renowned in their field, and uh, I'm sure they will have really good uh, questions for me um, later on. So just to, start up, uh, to have a background of the idea behind working on the book, the, the book is uh, basically guided by, or the idea of coming up with or working or researching on the topic of equality was basically guided by people's lived experiences, equality and poverty, equality and discrimination uh, with regards to various identity characteristics, disability, um, gender, sex, social origin, refugee status, and so on. 
And so the, the whole uh, task was how to translate people's lived experiences to legal language. Because uh, then if we translate uh, people's experiences in the various inequalities that they face into legal language, uh, guide policies, uh, be able to understand how courts are um, deciding on equality cases or how should they decide on equality cases. And also be able to pinpoint uh, loopholes that uh, exist with regards to people being um, able to litigate or bring challenges of discrimination and inequality in the courts. And so that was the, the key task. And uh, basically when I was thinking about uh, going through this task, uh, I obviously as uh, those who have gone through the book will realize I have focused on the courts a lot, but it does not mean that the task of dealing with inequality is just mainly for the courts. There it's, it's uh, the executive is tasked with uh, coming up with policies and uh, putting in the money to deal with the inequality as it relates to um, socioeconomic rights inequality. As you will hear uh, we'll, us talking about socioeconomic rights being provided for in Article 43 of the Kenyan constitution, which provides every person in Kenya with the right to health, right to housing, emergency medical care, water, food. What does that mean? It doesn't just mean that uh, it's up to the courts to make sure that these rights are provided for. And uh, also there needs to be legislation. And uh, a key, the book uh, is, as you will see, uh, and keep asking yourself, isn't there a legislation on equality? No, there is no equality act. Uh, and to translate the broader ideas or conceptions of equality in the constitution into reality and into actual or minute duties that would then meet the broader um, provisions of the Kenyan constitution. So th that, uh, as, uh, in, um, as much as I focus on courts, I mention to some extent the duties uh, of these other various organs in various parts of the chapter, or, uh, chapters and so on. So where do I begin? I begin uh, in 2010, where Kenyans were very excited to adopt a new constitution, which was overwhelmingly uh, accepted. And uh, then the, the many, every, every, many of the minority groups, be, be it uh, persons with disability, be it women, be it uh, marginalized ethnic groups and so on, they're so excited because they had something, hence the, the cover, of the book that I conceptualized with the artist. Um, so it's, everyone is waiting to get, because as you can see from the, the cover, uh, it's like uh, the constitution is a tap and everyone seeks to draw from the constitution. Various groups uh, in, in Kenya, they refer to the common monanchi, the common, the common person as Wanjiko, as Alicia might be aware, Ongoya. So, um, then I, I, I then uh, put it that after that excitement, then what? The real task begins of implementation. And how does implementation happen? So I start by saying that, first of all, if we have to think about uh, realizing these rights, we have to think about how do we interpret the constitution? So we have to think about the nature of the constitution itself. And uh, so then we go to chapter two, which talks about transformative constitutionalism. And uh, it's, it says, okay, transformative constitutionality in the context of the 2010 Kenyan constitution. So it uh, discusses the idea that uh, many Kenyan scholars and, and even the courts themselves, actually even the Supreme Court has referred to the Kenyan constitution as being transformative. So what does it mean to be trans a transformative constitution? What does it mean for interpretation? Okay. So I, I look towards the person who coined it, okay? So the person who, who coined it uh, is called Carl Clare, and he coined it with the understanding of the uh, South African constitution, 1996 South African constitution, and what that meant for the people. So I, I sought to, in the book six, to understand what Clare meant by transformative constitutionalism, and not just that, what does it mean to the Kenyan context, because as you can imagine, the Kenyan history of, uh, of colonialism or disadvantages is quite different from the South African one. Obviously, there are many correlations, okay? There are many correlations um, with regards to part of the context, but there are unique aspects. 
So hence the need, uh, after conceptualizing what Carl Clear meant about transformative constitutionalism, mainly that it's uh, dividing it into, into three parts as understood by Langer. So first of all, having a constitution brings in that aspect of past, what has happened in the past that we want to correct. Okay, but not for guessing that uh, also the concern is meant to guide the future. And then not just that, uh, we, we are looking at uh, transforming the, the, the country or the state with regards to equality, with regards to socioeconomic rights, with regards to affirmative action, that is uh, coming up with measures to redress a particular sort of a, uh, disadvantage or discrimination that has been experienced by a particular group in the past. So. What does that, uh, so all of that is basically changing uh, the, the state of the country, changing uh, whatever the people saw as being wrong and hence why they decided to have a new constitution. So this new and having new understanding and, and uh, conceptualizing the law as being something that looks at the context of the people and meets the people where they are at. So that's the understanding with regards to the, that first level. Then looking at the second level, the change in the legal culture. So the understanding of the fact that uh, a new culture, a change from the previous legal culture. So I look at the, what Claire imagines, uh, Langa imagines, and I look at the Kenyan context, what the constitution does with regards to a change of legal culture. So um, in Kenya, the previous legal culture was, if we look at the previous judiciary, it was so short in its uh, um, with regards to whether justice can be found in the courts. Um, and uh, basically, the issues to do with corruption, issues to do with the executive being uh, or dictating what should happen, uh, how the court should decide, and so on. And I look at some of the cases, um, and actually, I look at Alicia Ngoya's work to some extent, um, about basically what, what the scene looked like, okay? So basically, if you take a case against the government, the judgment would essentially be for the government, how would it not be, okay? But, but then what about justice? So that change in legal culture, and we find that the 2010 constitution sought to change the legal culture by providing independence of the, of the judiciary who elects the judges, um, the Judicial Service Commission, but who appoints the members of the Judicial, judicial Service Commission, as opposed to the previous constitution, most of the appointees of the Judicial Service Co uh, Commission, which appoints judges and other judicial officers, um, basically the membership is not appointed by the, most of the members are not appointed by the president. And even the two members that are, are to be appointed by the president are to be debated in parliament. So we can see a sort of uh, change in terms of who decides who, who can be a judge. So removing some control that the executive had in that, to that extent. And then also looking at the radical surgery of the judiciary in the vetting of judges and magistrates to remove, as uh, the, the board's mandate was, um, incompetent or corrupt judges and magistrates. So th that whole radical surgery saw the removal of some of the magistrates and judges who were seen as not being independent or being corrupt and so on. So that brought in a new, uh, th and then also there was the judicial transformation, changing the ideas of and um, sensibilities or uh, ideologies of how things should be done within the constitution. And I remember even uh, within the judiciary, and I remember even uh, David Biltis, you, you came for a workshop to train judges. And that's the first time I met you and I knew about your work and I got inspired by it. Um, so that, that sort of uh, change in the professional sensibilities. And then after that, we then entered into the, um, now there's the, that public trust, the concern, the concern also provided that, that the judiciary should be in charge of its own budget. So financial autonomy then would mean that things would be different, but uh, before I, uh, now uh, this year has been a bit challenging because we are seeing that the president has refused to appoint six, uh, six uh, judges who were uh, nominated to the Court of Appeal. So as much as the book was positive in that sense, uh, nuances in the past months tell us that there's something to be com concerned about, about the executive trying to interfere with the work of the judiciary. Also with regards to the judiciary's budget, there's been uh, 
move to kind of reduce the judiciary's budget and that obviously affects the working of the judiciary and its provision of access to justice to the people. So moving from that, I then talk about Article 257 of the Constitution and uh, in the context of transformative constitutionalism, uh, and also saying that obviously the change is constant as per the understanding of transformative constitutionalism. And that uh, idea basically means that interpretations of the Constitution might change with regards to the different generations. And we see, we, I look at Article 257 of the Constitution with regards to what it says about uh, 259 about how the constraint should be interpreted so article 259 so it says that uh, basically uh, I, I look at various um, in, uh, the various articles and on the whole it says that there should be a contextual purposive approach as per various judgments have already have also recognized so then I said okay uh, this is how we are going to look at the constitution and also in the idea of transformativeness is then uh, also confronted in various other chapters with regards to how the courts should approach cases. It shouldn't be just, obviously, Kenya is, Kenya is a common law jurisdiction and there's that approach to judging that is quite uh, adversarial. But we're saying that transformative also means that where there are self-representing litigants or where there is a matter of public interest, sometimes the court could uh, perhaps request for information, have some inquisitorial, um, take some inquisitorial approach perhaps, okay? And looking, about how, uh, looking at how that transformative idea could change the landscape as well with regards to the approach to cases. So moving from that, I then look at the equality proper. And equality proper, I look at um, now, what are these concepts of equality that we're talking about? And seeing that they are, they are very, quite diverse and uh, quite conflicting. So the constraint provides for, for instance, Equal, uh, equality of everyone. So the idea of formal equality, I'll just summarize with formal equality, that the idea that everyone should be treated the same. But then also uh, you realize that with regards to the many injustices, inequalities, uh, lack of participation for women, previously in the previous, uh, before the 2010 constitution, uh, there was only, I think, four, four women in parliament as a, uh, was the most before the 2010 constitution. How bad, <laughs> can just imagine. So we want to have something more, okay? Sometimes equality, uh, saying everyone should be treated equally can actually lead to an injustice. And then we move to substantive, the idea of substantive equality that actually you should look at something more. Yeah, you should look at something more with regards to just saying everyone should be treated equally, ignores that, for instance, there are regions in the country which have been uh, previously did not get lots of funding because of ethnicized politics in the country that then directed which uh, regions bought more money than others and so on. So you, how, how do you say that uh, now everyone is equal and yet there is an inequality? So I look at that substantive aspect of saying that let's look at the, let's look at the situation, let's look at the context. Uh, and then looking at uh, Ronald Dawkins idea about what does it mean to, uh, to treat people as equals? And saying sometimes treating people as equals would mean that you accommodate them with regards to persons of disability by having ramps or making sure that there are lifts in building. You, uh, and not just that, that you do something more for them. So I look at that idea and then move on to looking at affirmative action, how to expound on grounds of uh, disadvantage, such as uh, gender, uh, not just gender, race, um, sex, and so on. And then uh, I look at uh, religion versus uh, religion and uh, culture versus gender equality and socioeconomic rights. So uh, I could go on and on, but uh, basically that is uh, a quick preview. And then I said to harmonize those concepts, we have to first think about how do you treat someone as an equal? And also looking at this uh, treatment as an equal, we look at different dimensions the, uh, as conceptualized by my very great supervisor, Professor Sandra Feldman, uh, recognition, um, redressing uh, disadvantage or so distributive aspect. And we look at uh, political voice uh, and social inclusion. So basically looking at what to treat people as an equal, how to treat people as an equal or as equals, and uh, basically looking at various dimensions. Do you want to redress stigma? Do you want to uh, redress their disadvantage and so on? So thank you. And I look forward to uh, reactions and questions. Thanks very Absolutely. much, Victoria, for laying out, I suppose, that more the conceptual framework very much of 
of, of your book. And as you say, you can't go into the, all the specifics of the applications, et cetera. Um, but we will hear from some of the panelists who I'm sure will also lay out some of the specific arguments that you make. I do remember with great fondness engaging with Ken. He had a very exciting time with the judges and the sense of change that was taking place at the time on socioeconomic rights and limitations. And good to see that some in your book details, some changes uh, and, and some of the judges actually have implemented these, 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 these ideas. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Norm Fundo, who's going to kickstart the responses and engagement further with the ideas of Victoria. Over to you, Norm Fundo. Thank you so much, David. Um, I'm going to start a timer because as my supervisor who is here knows I can go on for forever. So I'm going to time myself. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, I hope you're all well. And, and thank you so much for this invitation from SciFac and the Bonavera. Um, it's such a privilege to speak uh, about a good friend, a colleague who I care for and respect a lot, uh, Victoria, Dr. Mandazi's book. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, I won't really say much about my reading of the book, uh, perhaps just to say that all of the comments and suggestions that I'm going to sort of explore um, are in the spirit of seeking to learn. Uh, they're meant to push all of us and myself um, into a deeper understanding of your thinking, Victoria, um, and, and your thoughts um, so that we can bring you uh, and the Kenyan experience into our classrooms, into our courts, um, as we work together um, to help communities that we care for, um, as you do, um, and as we struggle towards uh, eradicating inequality and fighting for a more just society, a uh, commitment that we all share. Um, so all of these comments are shared in that spirit, and I hope that um, we will have a really incredible and fruitful engagement. I read uh, the book uh, the last three days, and it was such a beautiful and incredible uh, time. Um, so thank you so much for writing the book. Um, so my first two questions are, you know, related to the fundamental conceptual framework in the book, and um, you just talked about a key part of it, and this is the idea of transformative constitutionalism. Um, so first, as you discussed in chapter two of the book, you know, transformative constitutionalism is a really complex ideal. Uh, but at its core, it suggests this possibility of transforming society through law. And as you know, um, in South Africa, this ideal is currently subject to robust critique from the left. Um, and uh, there's already existing critique of rights uh, and their limits to transforming society from feminist scholars um, more generally. And while I think the context of transformative constitutionalism in Kenya is distinct to South Africa and would likely escape some of the critique that we are having to grapple with in the South African context, I'm interested to hear what your response is to the broad critique uh, from the left or from feminist scholars of um, rights um, and, and sort of the emancipatory vision that they offer but are sometimes seen to be hollow when we sort of juxtapose what they say to offer with the reality of uh, persisting inequality in society. Um, I think in the book, you, you know, you're really clear that law and you were really clear in sort of your introduction now that the law is not a, the only avenue for transformation. And I think I, I agree with you and I think everyone here would agree with you. Um, however, there is something to be said about the visible emptiness of liberal constitutional rights when seen against the backdrop of prevailing inequality. So I'm quite keen for us to engage a little bit on that. Um, relatedly, you know, the book is about mechanisms to address past and, and persisting inequality in Kenya. And a book of this nature in any jurisdiction would, you know, at its very core, grapple with the specific historical context. Um, so in India, we would have to talk a little bit about the Hinduvana system and how it um, has had an impact on the construction of caste difference and sort of patterns of inequality in that jurisdiction. In South Africa, it would be race. Um, and I think what comes out really clearly in your book um, is that patterns of inequality in Kenya map onto ethno-regional differences. Um, however, I found that I was looking for a sort of some engagement with Kenya's colonial history and how it has shaped this ethno-regional difference. So I'm quite keen to engage a little bit more on, on this issue. Uh, because as a reader of Kenyan jurisprudence uh, from the outside, 
I understand that in conversation with you and other Kenyan scholars, um, when we were studying together, I understand the hegemony of some ethnic groups in Kenya, so Kikuyu, Kalenjin, Luya, Luo. So this is me eavesdropping on some conversations um, during our time together. Um, however, there hasn't been much in law, specifically in equality law, um, in the Kenyan perspective that I have seen that has canvassed Kenya's ethno-regional divides and its relation to patterns of inequality. I'd hope to find this in the book. And of course, one book can't canvas everything. Um, however, I am interested to hear your thoughts on the thread between Kenya's colonial history, patterns of ethno-regional inequality, how they map onto the other grounds, so gender, disability, youth as well, and um, the transformative vision in the 2010 constitution. So those are the two large sort of conceptual uh, questions that I have. And then I'm, I'm about to geek out a little bit. So everybody here who's not an equality lawyer will have to excuse me because the next two minutes, I'm gonna really hone in on specific textual and conceptual issues that Dr. Miyandazi grapples with in the book. Uh, and these ideas that I think are really promising and I, I'm quite keen for us to explore in more detail. Um, so I have to start by noting that I love your reading of Article 27.1 um, in Chapter 3 of the book. And for those who don't know, Article 27.1 of uh, Kenya's 2010 Constitution says that everyone is equal before the law and has a right to equal protection and benefit of the law. In the chapter, you argue that the promise of equal benefit of the law, uh, you know, has to be read to promise more than just equality of treatment. And this is great and a radical step because some jurisdictions haven't taken this route, my jurisdiction being one, where we've interpreted equal benefit and protection of the law to encompass very narrow, limited idea of formal equality. But in the chapter, you argue that this equal benefit of the law should be given a substantive meaning, meaning that we could see positive obligations arising from Article 27.1 of the Constitution. So we're not even in the realm of affirmative action. We are just still dealing with the equal benefit of the law. And already you're seeing this transformative vision of substantive equality being present. And what I was wondering, and I hope we can have this conversation a little later today, is um, how Article 27.1, as you read it, uh, relates to the other sort of positive obligations that arise um, in the other provisions in the Constitution. So one thing that you do is that you use reasonable accommodation as an example of an obligation that can arise from Article 27.1. But as, as we all know, Article uh, 54, Article 54.1 of the Kenyan Constitution actually creates reasonable accommodation separately in the context of disability uh, rights. So I'm quite interested to see what kind of relationship you're seeing or you, you envision between these different provisions in the constitution. So very textual, very geek out uh, question that I'm excited to, to listen to you about. Um, another issue that, you know, I, I'm teaching constitutional law at the moment uh, to second year graduates, second year undergraduate students. And one question that we spent about 30 minutes on is, why the presumption of unfairness in cases of dealing with uh, listed grants. So for people who are not equality lawyers, um, uh, discrimination on um, listed grounds in South Africa comes or there's an attachment of a presumption of unfairness. So that discrimination is presumed to be unfair. However, the text of the Kenyan constitution, unlike the South African constitution, which sort of mandates this presumption, doesn't have a similar ideal or approach. And this is on my reading, and I could be incorrect on this. But um, Dr. Miyandazi suggests that this presumption um, should operate similarly. So it should operate in cases where discrimination under Article 27.4 of the Kenyan constitution is on a listed ground, and it should not operate when it's on an analogous ground, right? And I've, I've found this sort of separation of listed and analogous grounds problematic because it suggests there being a hierarchy um, in sort of the, the prohibition of discrimination. It suggests that there are forms of discrimination that we think are particularly more wrong or more, ba more bad. Um, Taron is here, so he will correct the language I'm using to describe describe this, um, but it suggests that the harm based on the listed grounds is taken more seriously by the constitution than we take the harm on the unlisted grounds. 
and I'm not sure that we should take this approach. And because the Kenyan constitution doesn't textually require this, I wanted to ask you why you wanted to sort of go in this direction. Um, I see I have five more minutes and I'm going to move on to now a real geek out on the affirmative action uh, aspects of the book. Um, and we can come back to, to, to Article 27.1 uh, and Article 27.4 later on today. So I've had the pleasure of conversations with you about Article 27.6, uh, the affirmative action provision of the constitution in Kenya for many years. And I, there are many aspects of this provision that I think are important, radical, and have the potential to lead to substantive change. That said, I have to start with two issues that I wish were explored a little bit more in the book, and I want you to write another book uh, <laughs> to explore these a little bit more, especially since I, I want to learn from them as well. And I think the first has to do with uh, some analysis of the limits of affirmative action to redress inequality. And I think you spoke a little bit about equality more broadly uh, earlier on in your introduction. But, I, but I, you know, we know that most of these measures will likely just redistribute already existing resources. Um, they, they do nothing to really upend some of the structural aspects uh, or the root causes of inequality, right? And this is a com common critique across all jurisdictions of affirmative action. And I, I would have loved a deeper engagement with this because I think it would have allowed space to do something. And this would have been to foreground the importance of the other provisions in the Kenyan constitution, which uh, create positive obligations, like the prioritization principles that you discuss in chapter seven and eight in relation to realizing socioeconomic rights. And I think that would have come up a little bit more and popped if we had explored just the limits of Article 27.6 as affirmative action. And relatedly, I think the second um, question that I had relates to Chapter five is about affirmative action, but I was looking for some idea of how we are defining affirmative action in the text of Article 27.6 of the Constitution. Um, I think in the chapter, it's clear that different kinds of affirmative action are possible. Uh, under Article 27.6, uh, you, you refer to Uru Kenyatta's 2013 directive on the procurement um, that seeks to sort of benefit youth, women, people with disabilities, and then they use this word without competition. I mean, that's a specific form of, of affirmative action, right? It suggests a specific approach to merit. Um, and I would have loved to then have seen some attempt at least to map a definition or multiple definitions that could arise from the text of Article 27.6 um, in that chapter. And I think the importance of this definition or web of definitions can also be seen in Article 27.8, right? And I have one more minute, but I want to talk a little bit about this provision because Article 27.8 of the Kenyan Constitution does something that, that is very interesting. It says there is a two-third gender rule in appointment um, to, uh, I think it's, appointment bodies, right, or elected bodies, right, and it seems to suggest that this is symmetrical, right, so we might actually require that if there are too many women who tip the scale of the two-thirds rule, we have to then have a reverse affirmative action in favor of men, and, and, I, and I think a definition of affirmative action or definition of what Article 27.6 is trying to do within the context of Article 27 more broadly would have foregrounded the tension um, that this provision creates if we are to say that the purpose of affirmative action is to redress the hegemony of specific groups in society. And I think had we had some definition or multiple definitions, this kind of tension could have come up a little bit more uh, because I think it's an interesting debate that at the moment in South Africa, we are having in silos. We, we're currently talking about whether we need white men on the constitutional court bench. And, and part of this debate is about whether or not there is an obligation for equitable representation more broadly um, beyond redressing specific forms of historic disadvantage. Um, so I'm keen to hear some of your thoughts on the symmetric application of Article 27.8. And just to conclude, uh, 
Thank you for an incredible contribution, uh, Dr. Miandazi. Uh, your work on equality law, I'm really excited and I'm hopeful that courts, the legislature and the executive in Kenya and elsewhere will take the arguments and suggestions that you make into account in the struggle to eradicate inequality for all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nomfundo, uh, for those very rich comments, engaging, as you say, both with certain broad conceptual issues and also some technical issues. And there are technical issues around equality that need engagement. Uh, and some of the technical issues also lead to an examination of some of the deeper conceptual issues, as you've you've said. Uh, I'd like to push you also, when we have question time, about the last point, about uh, the, the, the reverse question of whether you should... Uh, you know, if you had 80% of women in parliament or 90%, would there, uh, would there be any duty to, to include men as well? And, and, and also complexity that arises around, um, and, and Victoria may also want to engage with this about when you have a, a lot of vulnerability, how do you, in some senses, prioritize amongst people? And does that lead to, to issues, particularly in questions of uh, where there's large amounts of ethnic tension? Uh, which exists in 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 Kenya. So, um, but the, the I'm getting ahead of our discussion there. Thank you for the for the questions, and um, we will uh, Victoria will have a chance to reply after our next uh, presenter, who's going to be Elisha Ngoya. Elisha, uh, welcome. I know we've had a chance to engage before uh, about the position in Kenya and uh, the constitutional issues, and it's great to have you again here and. Uh, over to you for your 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thank you, Nomfundo, for, for the observations so far made. I hope I can be heard. And over the next 15 minutes, I'm trying to time myself as well, lest I, I spill over the time beyond acceptable limits. Uh, Victoria, there are multiple respects in which your book comes across as authoritative to me. When I read your book, I get the impression that I'm reading good authority. The reason being, I have seen you grow on the Kenyan soil as a young guy. There's a sense in which you have a lived experience of the Kenyan inequality manifestations. And, and that lends authority to your book. Number two, you're not just another Kenyan writing a book on equality. You are a Kenyan woman, hence you come from that space that is recognized both in public discourse and in Kenya's constitutional law as a group that has historically been treated as unequal. So, so there's a level to which your lived reality supersedes what I, for example, would have done if I were writing a book on inequality, because although Kenyan, I would be regarded as an, an outsider to the practice and the feeling of inequality. So that context is important to me. And that's why I take your book very seriously. And I regard your book as perhaps the most authoritative work on inequality law in Kenya. Uh, number two, the manifestations of inequality in Kenya are many and they far surpass those ones recognized in Article 100 of the Constitution. So when you read Article 100 of, of the Constitution as an outsider, you may regard it as a complete catalog of the manifestations of inequality in Kenya. But when you live in Kenya, you notice, for example, that Article 100 does not recognize the poor as a special category of people who have been historically you know, marginalized, the poor as the poor. Yet, Victoria, particularly knowing where you come from geographically, you understand the place of poverty as a classification of an unequally treated population. And it's significant. I mean, it, it may not fit conventional um, pigeon hauling, but strictly speaking, if you live on the ground here, Kenya stands out as one of the most unequal societies, perhaps, or not. Having said that, there are some things that uh, I think are important to pay attention to, even when we look at the text of the constitution and how it treats an inequality. The starting point for me is always 
the preamble. I've always said the preamble infuses as the informing spirit in this constitution. It, it, it regards many other things as factual, but regards our approach to equality as aspirational. It says recognizing the aspirations of all Kenyans for a government based on the essential values of human rights, equality, freedom, democracy, social justice, and the rule of law. These things are an aspiration. Kenyans look forward to them. It means they are not there. It means that the lived reality by those who are drafting the constitution presented them with a reality that we, we look forward to the day we shall have a society that practices these values. We look forward to a society that will be equal. We look forward to a society that will treat us as, in a, the words of scripture, as children of the same God, so to speak. So that is important that we reflect on that. Why is this aspirational? And I think that's where Mfundo comes from in spelling out that she desired to see an element of history, the, the perhaps contribution of Kenya's historical, I mean, colonial history to this. Well, Kenya's colonial history and South Africa's colonial history may present different nuances. Uh, to, to this question here, because uh, the inequality in Kenya is, if you study section of paper number 10 of 1965, the development, that paper itself is now recognized as having entrenched inequality in the society, particularly as you know, uh, insisting that development has to be carried out along the lines of high potential areas. Areas that are categorized, and this categorization is quite arbitrary, as low potential, then are not the priority. It means if you are born in a low potential area, you are predestined to economic inequality as a, a, a phenomenon a, a, a in the Kenyan context. So that's, that's critical when you study Kenya's uh, manifestations of, of, of inequality. Then to underscore this aspiration, you can see the number of times the quest for equality is provided for in the constitution. You find in the preamble, you find article 10, you find article 27, you find article 232. In multiple areas, you will see this talk, this writing uh, in the text of the constitution on equality in a very aspirational sense, how we should you know, staff the public service, for example, it must be in a manner that respects uh, this principle of equality, et cetera, et cetera. Then let me come to the aspect of your book that is at the heart of my day-to-day -day practice, which is litigation. Your book invests heavily on the court's jurisprudence on equality. <clears throat> and I can understand why. Lisha, I think we're having some problems with the audio. Uh, let's just hope it recovers. We were hearing you good, well up to now, but now. Uh, Lisha, we, we, we're, we're having trouble, sadly. Is that was going so well that largely gave up on other sectors i mean if you look the source of hope did i miss it elisha sorry we haven't heard you for the last two minutes or so yeah i'm wondering why you uh, i can hear yes if, can you hear me, if, can you now? okay maybe better if you yes switch off the video and oh, uh, perhaps uh, if you can go back to your point i think you were uh just about two minutes ago um Roughly, we 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 missed out on a minute. Asian in Kenya. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I think I got to a point where I was reflecting on the aspects of the book that deal with the court's jurisprudence on inequality, and I was saying that aspect excites me because my day-to-day -day practice is in litigation, 
And I'm able to reflect on what the courts say about each of these principles and the handicaps that the court faces every day when it's confronted with questions on inequality. And allow me to just reflect on two cases uh, because uh, I mean, I could go on and on on this question of inequality and the court's jurisprudence, but let me just focus on two cases uh, which you had a chance to look at. The case of Federation of Women Lawyers versus the Judicial Service Commission. And I was a litigation counsel in this case and, and I take responsibility for the way in which we lost this case and got a hopeless definition of the practice of affirmative action in, the Kenyans, in Kenya's inequality jurisprudence. First, the case was not that strategic because this case attacked a decision of the Judicial Service Commission in the courts. And this decision of the Judicial Service Commission was the first decision taken under the chairmanship of the then Chief Justice William Mutu when he presided over the nomination for appointment of judges of the Supreme Court and in the final analysis got less than two thirds of the composition of the Supreme Court to be women. And we took this question to court in light of Article 27, sub -article, Clause 8 of the Constitution to ask, is the composition of the Supreme Court thereby constitutional? And does it accord with the equality dictates of Article 27, 8 of the Constitution? The judges, you could see, stretched themselves too far because we posed very simple questions that if you tell us that Article 27, 8 of the Constitution is progressively realizable, as opposed to our argument that it is immediately realizable, you must be able to tell us what are the factors that inform your conclusion that it has to be progressively realizable. And we drew parallels with resource sensitive socioeconomic rights, which sometimes lend themselves to the argument of progressive realization by saying resources are economically understood to be difficult to come by, to be realizable progressively. We get money incrementally and therefore rights that are subject to money will themselves be subject to that incremental acquisition of resources. What will you be telling us about women in the Supreme Court? Will you be suggesting that we get women incrementally when statistics show that in Kenya women far outweigh men in number and in the legal profession, which is the primary source of resource for Supreme Court staffing, women also far surpass men in number by recent statistics. And uh, the question was simple and straightforward, but you could see the frustration the court was in was that answering that question in favor of the petitioners would have meant questioning the newly appointed Chief Justice in his very first decision. I sometimes think that we were not very strategic in filing that case against the party we filed it against. We should have approached that case against a straw man. Maybe some sugar authority somewhere in Western Kenya, which would have staffed his department without women, then get jurisprudence from it, they're now using that jurisprudence, use it to fight you know, people of strategic positioning like the then Chief Justice. <clears throat> Compare that with the case of Mohammed Musa Dagane and others versus the Attorney General. And this case was a poor community in Northern Kenya that was completely treated without any regard to its dignity. Anytime the government wanted to start any public project, it evicted this community from its community land without any regard to compensation or without any regard to formalities of resettlement or anything of the sort. Now that was an, a classical case because you remember in Mohammed Musa Ragane, we found judgment in favor of the petitioners in a socioeconomic rights case, but we were litigating the right to housing, which is more complex to get a favorable judgment as opposed to the Federation of Women Lawyers, where we post a more simple and straightforward question. So I close by saying 
that equality jurisprudence will be more progressive if we, the litigation lawyers, are more strategic about the cases that we choose. And we will rather start off with cases that generate lesser heat, cases that disturb the status quo less, then the judges will evolve more progressive jurisprudence. Then we can now use that progressive jurisprudence to run roughshod on the status quo. Otherwise, there's a lot I can say on this jurisprudence, and I would invite our listeners to also take advantage of advisor opinion number two of 2012, which is in the matter of the gender composition of the National Assembly and the Senate. And the jurisprudence attendant to that in the cases of the Center for Rights, Education and Awareness versus the Attorney General, which led to the recent advice by the Chief Justice for the president to dissolve parliament. Fortunately, I was involved in the whole body of that litigation. I can take the next two days talking about it, but I think there we were more strategic. We litigated incrementally. We identified fewer questions. We presented questions that antagonized the institution of the judiciary itself less and, and, and thereby increasingly got more progressive jurisprudence up to the moment when we are wrestling at the Court of Appeal on whether or not the president will comply with the advice by the Chief Justice to dissolve parliament. Kudos for this book. I look forward to a sequel to this book as recommended by my very good colleague Mfundo, because it's inevitable that you have to do it, having distinguished yourself as the leading thinker and scholar on equality law in this jurisdiction. Uh, over to you, uh, David. Thank you very much, Elisha. High praise indeed for your book, uh, Victoria. Uh, you raised lots of interesting questions, uh, Elisha. Also actually self-reflective ones about litigation strategy. I am interested to hear maybe Elisha or Victoria a little bit more about, you can perhaps tell us a bit later about the Me Too Bell case and the overturning in the Court of Appeals and what's the story behind that and whether there's hope for uh, for, for, for an overturning again in the, in the Supreme Court or if that's the end of the story and, and wh whether there were some uh, failures there in litigation strategy or whatever happened. It's, it deals, it's an eviction case and uh, initially progressive in the High Court and then was kind of overturned in the Court of Appeal, at least on the order. So uh, without further ado, uh, thank you, Alicia. Over to Taranab Keitan. Taranab, uh, over to you for your 15 minutes. Thanks very much, David, and uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm a real interloper to this uh, discussion because I know absolutely nothing about Kenya uh, whatsoever, uh, which is why I specifically requested that I go after um, uh, Numfundo and Alicia uh, from both of whose presentations I have uh, learned a great deal and, and perhaps um, uh, gathered some confidence to say what I'm about to say, but I, I I want to start by first congratulating Victoria on on the book itself. Um, it is uh, really well written, very accessible, easy to read, um, about a jurisdiction that is clearly outside what has become the canon of comparative constitutional law. Um, and uh, and not least for that reason, an extremely important um, work that scholars of comparative constitutional studies uh, must engage with. Um, obviously, uh, in large part, um, the book, like the Kenyan Constitution, is a um, an aspirational and a speculative project because Victoria has not had the benefit of uh, decades long, uh, you know, experience of a body of case law and jurisprudence. Uh, so this is in large part thinking ahead and that, that project uh, presents the scholar with considerable uh, difficulties um, and to some extent is necessarily a leap of faith. So, um, so, uh, so, so a lot of what I'm going to say is perhaps uh, going to put pressure on that faith um, and, 
and the lens I will use with 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 great uh, awareness of the fact that Kenya is not India, and uh, and with the hope that you will do things differently <laughs> than how India did uh, did things, right? But but if if there is any value in learning from the mistakes of others, I think um, what went wrong in in India, which in some ways is a comparable project and a similar leap of faith, and um, and, and perhaps uh, you know there were Indian Indian scholars in the eighties uh, saying a lot of things that Victoria is saying now about Kenya. So so I think that that lens, you know, for what it's worth, may um, may well be helpful. So so I I say this uh, with with all those caveats attached. I should also say that um, while a lot of my earlier work is on uh, equality and discrimination, and David kindly mentioned my book, um, most of my current work is on uh, constitutional theory more generally and thinking about democracy and constitutional theory. So, so in the time I have, I'm mainly going to focus on uh, the first part of the book and especially on the idea of transformative constitutionalism and its um, uh, sort of potential to, to, to secure what I, what I would broadly sort of refer to as progressive political objectives uh, that I'm sure many people, at least on this panel, share um, and, and, uh, and not going to the weeds of the equality jurisprudence, although I very much look forward to uh, Victoria's responses to Numfundo's uh, pressures on those points. And I might come back to them in the Q&A anyway. So let me uh, start with um, sort of the framing of the transformative uh, constitutionalism project. By the way, I should also say that a lot of the things that I'm going to pick up have already been uh, highlighted or noted by both Nomfundo and Elish Shah. So in some ways, this is just an elaboration of some of those um, pressure points. Um, so around page nine, I think, Victoria, that is where you um, present a typology uh, from Justice Langer on, um, on what is transformative constitutionalism. And I'll uh, primarily use that frame and go into each of those worries in a moment. But I was, I first wanted to talk about what is the nature uh, of your theoretical move there. So the title of section B on page 10, um, as well as the discussion that follows, uh, seems to suggest that the methodological move you're making is that if a constitution satisfies these three features or has these three features that Langer identifies, then that constitution is transformative. And, and once we characterize a constitution as transformative, then certain things follow normative, right? There are certain ways we should do things. Um, I wasn't entirely sure that uh, Justice Langer's uh, categories were in fact um, meant to do what you did with them, which is, um, I thought they were normative categories rather than conceptual. Uh, so the difference is this, right? So a conceptual claim would be, or an example of a conceptual claim would be, but you know, uh, how do we know whether a system is parliamentary or presidential? Right? So the conceptual claim is to identify its essential features to say if parliament can fire the premier at will, it is a parliamentary system. Doesn't matter what the system calls itself, right? which is the reason why some people would classify South Africa as a parliamentary system, even though the head is a president. Right? So that's a conceptual claim. Um, a normative claim would be uh, that, you know, for example, if there's a corruption scandal in a government department, the concerned minister should resign, whether or not it was her fault uh, that that corruption scandal took place. Right? That's a normative claim. Now, I read uh, Langer's three features 
um, is entirely totally normative, which is to say that whether the constitution is transformative or not is a prior question to be settled independently. And we, you know, I'll, I'll say something about how we might settle that. But once you decide that the constitution is transformative, then do these things, right? So these are, as it were, um, uh, you know, normative recommendations, which is look backward and forward, have a certain type of legal culture, be open to change. So I, I didn't see them as essential conditions that a constitution must meet to be transformative. Um, but that opens up, if, if I'm right about that, and if I also, I might have read your claims there incorrectly, so forgive me if, if that I got that wrong, but if I've read you correctly and if I'm right that whether a constitution is transformative or not has to be an independent judgment, then it matters how, how do we decide whether a constitution is transformative, right? Because a lot hangs on it, in not least how judges should approach its interpretation, right? So uh, whether a constitution is transformative or not, does that, does that depend on the intention of the framers? Uh, does it, is it a doctrinal matter? So if courts say it is transformative, it is transformative. Um, is it an independent moral judgment that we make based on our ideas of justice in a particular uh, system, right? So uh, is it a political judgment that political actors make in a particular, so I, I don't have answers, I'm just raising these questions to, to try to think about what it, uh, who, so not just how do we decide who, whether a constitution is transformative, because it is an important question, but, but who gets to decide whether a constitution is transformative? And, you know, can a constitution that was, to, to, you know, so I was thinking about the opposite of a transformative constitution, and, you know, uh, Gary Jacobson's distinction between uh, what he calls acquiescent and militant constitutions is quite helpful here, I think, because, um, so he uses the word militant for transformative constitutions, constitutions that try to change the society they are situated in, and, um, uh, and acquisitive constitutions are constitutions that are quite happy with the society they find themselves in, right? So, uh, so if, if an acquiescent constitution is the opposite of a transformative constitution or a militant constitution, um, can, can a constitution change form, right? So can a transformative constitution having achieved its objectives become a quasar? Um, or in a quasar constitution, Gary Jacobson's example is the Irish constitution. Can it later become transformative, right? And what are the mechanisms through which uh, this change takes place? So that's sort of the first question. And obviously I located within, within the first frame that you use from Langa, which is both backward looking and forward looking, right? Because <clears throat> uh, so, and, and I'm sure, you know, Kim Shepley's work here of, you know, she talks about aversive and aspirational constitutions, aversive constitutions are sort of never again constitutions, right? They have a terrible past trauma and they say we'll never go back there. Aspirational constitutions are just entirely forward looking. And, and you're saying, you know, transformative constitutions have to be a bit of both, right? They have to be aversive as well as aspirational. And maybe the part of the mistake in the Indian context was that uh, India decided to do transformation entirely aspirationally, right? So there was there was no aversive, except some dissenting opinions early on in the 50s, there was no aversive dimension. So the system never asked what was so wrong about colonialism, uh, right? And, uh, unlike South Africa's approach to apartheid, where, you know, you keep reminding yourself about, about apartheid, right? So, so I'm wondering whether that that is a lesson to be drawn about different types of transformative um, moves that a constitution can make. The second point I want to make about uh, about the project more generally, and this is a this is a pet peeve. So so you know, uh, oftentimes you know, I'm sure you know of reviewers, um, and here this is an example, sort of yours truly, a case in point, right? Reviewers who um, who have their own project and always tell uh, everything they review that you should have done this instead, right? Which is what I'm interested in. So if you will, if you will uh, uh, allow me to 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 to, to to fly my flag for a moment, or my, my current flag for the moment. Um, it, it bothers me uh, increasingly from a, you know, left progressive perspective um, that we continue to equate constitutionalism and constitutionalization with uh, judicialization. 
And a lot of what I'll say later uh, is drawn from that equation. And obviously, you know, this this comes from sort of the trauma of being an Indian and, uh, you know, with somebody whose country is, is going through a fascist moment, right? And, and the courts are basically, if not cheerleaders, they're certainly you know, some, sometimes cheerleaders, sometimes just watching by, right? So, so with a deep progressive skepticism of courts uh, is sort of uh, one theme that I want to explore. And I've, I've done, done that work in, in some of my other papers. So, you know, you say paper on what politics can do for progressive causes and in what constitution, how constitutions can imagine progressive politics as a constitutional matter, right? Not just as a policy matter. So the difference between policy of the government of the day and politics, constitutional politics, right? So anyway, I'll, I'll put that to one side because I know that it's my own hobby horse, but I, I just had to say that. Um, <clears throat> so delving deeper into this worry about courts and judges, uh, which is, um, David, I'm counting on you to sort of keep me on the straight and narrow with time. Uh, so, you know, the, the change of culture and attitude, and it was hard to pin down exactly what Langa uh, had in mind, but it seemed that there were several moves that were sort of uh, interesting. Okay, so uh, my time is almost over. I'll, I'll wrap up in three minutes. Um, there's a move from a captured or compromised court to an independent court. Now that is not a transformative agenda, right? That is just an agenda of constitutionalism, separation of powers. Yeah, or to put it differently, you don't have to be a transformativist to say that's obviously welcome. Um, but other moves from formalism to whatever substantivism might be, or, uh, or from procedural justice to substantive justice, et cetera. I think one of the key lessons we have learned in India is that um, the only checks on judges are processes, formality, and public reasoning. Uh, and the only people who can police these checks are uh, the legal academy and the bar. And once you invite the judiciary to break these chains by moving towards a culture of substantive full justice, uh, the judiciary becomes in a completely unconstrained because the only things that I ever checked it. So if you start treat, treating judges like politicians and criticizing them like politicians, they start behaving like politicians. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy and uh, an Indian judges behave like politicians, right? So there is no uh, judicial discipline uh, left in India. And, and then you are counting on good luck to hope that they will do the things you like to do or you would like them to do, right? And they will not continue doing things. You know, so the statelessness of millions of people in India today was led by the judiciary, not the executive. The judiciary forcing tens of thousands of people into detention camps in the Eastern state of Assam today, right? So, and, and unwittingly, at the same time, this transformative agenda or discourse can give these judges enormous amounts of political legitimacy, often amplified by foreign scholars teaching in, you know, Europe and America, which actually allows them to get away with a lot of uh, bad things at home, right? So, uh, so that's the second. The last thing I would say is, you know, openness to change, which is, you know, has transformative constitutionalism or its various elements actually been effective in achieving its promises anywhere in the world. Right? Now, you know, Namfundo very rightly said, one book cannot do everything, right? And this is, this is not a doctrinal question. This is an empirical question, right? It can only be answered empirically. But I worry, you know, and we have some material from Ferraz in Brazil, from Bovania in India, from a lot of people who have shown that transformative constitution not only fails to do what it seeks out to do, but can actually have counter intuitive, unintended consequences. So there is a worry about that. And the big exclusion of class, which I think, you know, Alicia mentioned again, you know, this is another hobby horse. So I will just, you know, uh, send the link here as well. But, you know, there are things that constitutions can do about poverty and plutocracy, which no understanding of transformative constitutionalism seem, seems to me to have captured. So do we actually, even if it did achieve everything it promises to achieve, 
can we actually still say this is the great thing to have from a sort of an entirely instrumental progressive politics lens. So, so this is what I sort of end with, right? Which is, um, but, you know, are codes good for pol progressive politics, at least from sort of the Indian experience? I think the answer has to be maybe, uh, right? But there's a long tradition of British left being deeply skeptical of the judiciary too. Um, can they be strategically useful in the, in the way that Alicia mentioned? Uh, of course, but only sometimes, right? And they can be strategically useful both to progressive politics and to reactionary politics. Um, is there nonetheless a general expressive value in judicial affirmation of key constitutional values like equality? Of course, but we still need to ask whether these expressive gains through a ritualistic judicial affirmation of key constitutional values outweighs potential losses, material as well as expressive, to the polity, to equality, and to democracy more generally. Thank you very much, I'll shut up there. Thanks very much, Tarunab, for that, uh, those comments and uh, perhaps shedding a, a sort of slightly more skeptical light on questions of uh, transformative constitutionalism. I suppose um, I, I'm more sympathetic to transformative constitutionalism uh, with Victoria. And in a sense, I think one of the problems perhaps is that uh, sometimes the critics write up their critique very strongly, but our, the defenders don't actually necessarily write up all the, 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 the successes that, that have taken place uh, in various parts of the world from it. And there's also a question really as what is success, right? Are we looking at ultimate full realization of the aspirations or are we looking at a um, the creation of a process of moving into uh, reality very difficult ideals um, and uh, providing certain law governed constraints but I'm starting to engage in the debate uh, which I'm sure we're going to have uh, and it is um, for Victoria to now provide responses Victoria you've had a rich set of comments I know you won't be able to do with all of them so um, please feel free to focus on some of those that you want to address now, and we will still have an opportunity for questions. We really, really want those in our audience to participate as well. Those of you who've really joined us, and I'm sure you've joined because you have a particular interest in this topic, and you've heard the debate, you've, I think, got a flavor for the arguments in the book. Uh, please, I've already seen a great question about the judiciary, which we'll come to in the Q&A please feel free to put in more questions and further questions uh, as we go along. Uh, so over to you, Victoria, for some responses, and then we will open to the Q&A. Okay, um, thank you so much uh, to the speaker, to the panelists, and they're very, they're very insightful um, thoughts, comments, questions. I really appreciate them, and they will go to enriching if there's, there'll be a next edition and so on, or... Um, now with Nompundo's quest, uh, questions, I'm thinking uh, maybe perhaps a whole book on affirmative action. Um, so let me start with a question raised by Mariam Zofa uh, in the chat, Q&A chat box. So Mariam, you, you're asking, you mentioned J Judicial Service Commission and its role to appoint judges who will be, I suppose, impartial in guaranteeing the rights accorded to the constitution. How does the new cons uh, composition of JSC differ from the previous constitution? And what is the experience so far in the 10 years since promulgation? Okay, so let's look at uh, what we have in terms of uh, the previous in, in the book. So in the book, I set out what, what was wrong with regards to the composition of the former Judicial Service Commission. So I look at what was the composition the, and uh, who appointed them. So essentially the Chief Justice uh, sat in the Judicial Service Commission was a presidential appointee. The Attorney General was a uh, presidential appointee. The uh, Head of the Public Service uh, Commission was a presidential appointee. The two representative uh, presidential appointees, essentially, that tells you there's a lot of influence coming from the president or the executive rather. So um, you also find, uh, and what is the difference now? So with regards to the appointment of the Judicial Service Commission, you see that uh, only two, nom two persons are, no are nominated actually presidential nominees, right? Uh, to who represent the public and so on. You find that there's, a, there's someone who is uh, voted by the Law Society of Kenya to represent, to be, to sit on the, 
on the commi commission, there's um, representat the representative of the magistrates, representative of the judges for the various levels, High Court, Court of Appeal, Supreme Court, obviously the Chief Justice, Deputy Chief Justice. So you find that most of these uh, members of the Judicial Service Commission are, uh, we can see uh, there's some level, level of independence. It depends on how we think about it. Uh, perhaps you could question the two um, nominees uh, by the president. Um, but essentially you can see based on the previous constitution and now what we have now, and especially, especially what we have now, it's a big difference. Okay, and that then, Mariam, that's how I would um, answer you. Th that's the difference between uh, the composition, and it's basically who is a, a presidential appointee, and so on. Um, so then, uh, let me let me uh, start addressing Nomfundo's questions. So I have noted them down. So the first one I'll uh, respond to. It's tied uh, to Tyrone's questions as well, with regards to transformative constitutionalism. So for my understanding of transformative constitutionalism, I can just say practicing law in Kenya has been quite insightful. And uh, also with regards to, I can just say, before I went to do my, my studies in Oxford, I worked at the judiciary as well. And I worked with judges. And I attended some of the sessions of the Constitutional and uh, Human Rights Division of the High Court. And uh, basically, what motivated me to write about, as I said, one of the things that motivated me was my lived experience. I wished I was on the other side, uh, being a lawyer, because I saw so many things that lawyers did wrong. And uh, <laughs> being in the courts, uh, that was in uh, between 2012 and 2013. Being in the judiciary, I could, there, was a, there, there was a new air. There were trainings, there were sensitizations, there were new uh, computers, desktops, People used to type, you know, the, the typewriters that were there in the past, now uh, there was a change to computers. And um, <laughs> basically also having uh, law clerks and uh, legal researchers to assist the judges. And uh, you find that uh, there was a new wave. And also you find that there's new thinking about how you interpret the law, uh, not just guided by formalistic approaches that uh, if someone file something in the wrong way, then the case is dismissed. Um, you, and we find we find a resonance in the constitution. And that's why um, in chapter two, as much as I talk about Langer's approach and uh, Claire and various other understandings about transformative constitutionalism presented, I then go, I'm careful to go back and to the constitution itself and look at what does it actually say? What can we pick out in saying that they, there should be constant change and what not? And all of this is guided by my what I saw in the courts. Uh, in one case, you'd find that there was a really important case on the right to information before the constitutional division of the high court. And the, the lawyers, you know, it was just, all of this was all new to the lawyers. Uh, the new constitution, we have new rights. We actually have a right to information uh, for, from public uh, bodies. You actually have socioeconomic rights, but then you've never litigated this. Uh, these things have never been litigated before in the court. So I saw the judge saying, okay, uh, you haven't really, I, I can't see from this uh, application, I can't see what you're asking me to rule, uh, rule on. So that inquisitorial approach saying, okay, go back, amend your pleadings, because really uh, this doesn't, uh, it's really important perhaps, but uh, I, how can I help you if your pleadings are not properly drafted? And you saw some, uh, where, where there was a self-representing litigant, you saw some, some inquisitorialness, basically. And also because uh, for persons who haven't learned law and you find that these are so many, I'm sure it's the same in South Africa, in India. These are, these are people who don't really know, uh, understand the law as much. And so they would need some little, some set, uh, little guidance. So you find that inquisitorial approach. And for me, that was quite transformative from what I had seen while I was, uh, while I was uh, doing my judicial attachment pre, uh, okay, or just before the 2010 constitution. So for me, that then was alive when we're looking at article 259 on how the constitution should be interpreted. And also other provisions like uh, article 159 of the constitution on uh, without undue regard to procedural technicalities. And uh, not just that, uh, with regards to uh, Tyron's questions about, um, the, the, the whole idea about uh, transformativeness, how does it help us in terms of uh, 
what should happen? You think that uh, mainly it's all about the normative, normativity, normative recommendations, and I find a lot of guidance uh, in the in the in that transformative idea. Obviously, it's just sometimes as lawyers we need a tag to to um, refer to what is happening in the constitution and what we can see. And for me, that tag mainly was captured by transformative constitutionalism and what it means. So, with regards to social economic rights. Um, I saw that with regards to the fact that law tells us that judges should look at cases or judicial officers should look at cases as they relate to the people who have brought the litigation. But you see that when you talk about certain rights like equality, um, when, you, when, you, when a person from a group, one group takes a case, like a person, one of the cases I look at HIV status, that will affect everyone who is HIV positive. So you find that some the nature of the rights that have been provided in the constitution are quite different and so that means that uh, the ideas that applied previously would have to change because uh, essentially you're not just thinking about the persons before you and as you, you see in the judge in the judges in that case justice mumbengogi's approach she looked at the whole context not just for the people who were before the court and not just in that case okay so for me, I find some, some ideas about transformativeness in the way the courts have looked at uh, such cases. And then um, also the, uh, the ideas about, uh, you asked, Tarun asked uh, with regards to that, the nature of um, the three features. So the three features, I also latch them onto the constitution as well. So that's my way of making it contextual and making it not just normative, but actually this is in the, in the actual black letter law. So that's uh, that was my concern as well. I didn't want it to look like, okay, I'm looking at these principles. Where am I taking them from? Um, how are they applicable? Much like what is happening now in Kenya with the BBI case, everyone thinking about, okay, these uh, new concepts that are being uh, brought, are they really in the constitution or are they just comp comp uh, theories uh, conceptualized by some scholars um, that are not really applicable? So for me, I, I had that, in mind and that, that I preempted such a critique. And that's why I used it basically to, latch, to, to explain what was happening and what needs to happen, uh, grounded on the constitution, of course. And then uh, now moving on to uh, Nofundo again's question, um, perhaps more, uh, okay, in terms of transformativeness and their rights and their limits to transforming society. So uh, now coming back to Kenya after my PhD, working as a lawyer, I could see justice. I could use the constitution and the constitution and actually like some parts of what I've argued in my PC, my, my PhD to in litigation of cases that it was, it's actually exciting that actually just as a, when you do good submissions that are well-reasoned that have these cases, you actually get the rights. The only challenge comes in when you're, there are cases involving the government. That's when it becomes tricky about where, uh, what will happen. Um, as Alicia has explained in some of the cases. So the, the real, real big cases are the challenging ones. And those are the ones that bring change to the most of the people. And I agree with um, uh, Ongoya about the incrementalism, uh, having strategic litigation and having an incre incremental approach. Because also, this is okay from my, my approach and from my understanding, I could sense that uh, there's a difference in terms of judges who, um, this is a new constitution and most of the judges studied law in a context in which most of these rights were not there, they're not being taught. So that's why even judicial transformation was important and trainings are important because then you empower them because clearly in some judgments, as I in the book as well, you can see a lack of understanding uh, actually what a structural interdict means. Is it uh, what a uh, interlocutory you know, whatever, maintaining supervisory jurisdiction, what it actually means. And the Mitubel case also uh, gives some clarification as uh, we will discover. So that's all I have to say. So I think that actually the, the, the main problem is with implementation by the con contempt of court cases. So what is the legislature doing? What is the executive doing? They're really the ones that in Kenya are failing. So when you talk about transformative constitutionalism and actually is there a limit to 
of, of, of rights in transforming society. Rights can really transform society, but you find that you get you get a, a wall. You hit a wall when you reach now implementation and enforcement against the state, the executive, and so on. So that's my understanding. The problem is not transformative personalism in Kenya. The problem is with implementation. And then um, colonial history. Nomfunda talked about that. I didn't speak a lot about. I talked about the history of um, ethnic, um, the ethnicity in Kenya, uh, ethno-regional inequalities. And uh, actually, Nomfunda, if you if you if you looked at previous chapters, I had talked about that a lot. But then I said I don't want to write a book about history. You see, <laughs> because there's that temptation. You enter into a trap. Okay, you enter into a trap. And then that has been, a lot of people have talked about that history. So I talked about the history, as, as you saw in, a, you can see in chapter two of the book, I talk, talk about the history as it relates to groups that I'm going to refer to. So I talked about history of marginalization and how ethnically marginal minorities uh, ended up being disadvantaged and so on. And I talked about that um, history in a bit, and I put uh, some explanations as well in the footnotes, because always you would end up into that trap of just focusing a lot on the history and losing the whole point. So that's what was my strategic move to use the history as it related to the groups that I'm referring to mainly, or the issues that I'm going to refer to. So uh, also with regards to the question about, um, with regards to the various, you talked about affirmative action. Okay, before I go to affirmative action, um, Article 27, one, which talks about equal benefit of the law, and which I said that, uh, for instance, for, for what does it mean for persons to equally benefit from the law? That means that uh, when you're providing infrastructure, for instance, I use, uh, you rightly correct, you, you rightly point out, I use example of persons with disabilities, physical disabilities. So that if, you, if you're implementing um, policies and uh, meeting rights, like provide provision of health, you should make sure for, for, for everyone to equally um, benefit, you need to have sign language interpreters, you need to have RAMs and so on. So that idea is more positive. You accommodate, it's not basically treat, treating everyone as an equal, but um, what does it mean to be? Okay, not, not equal treatment, but what does it mean to treat everyone as an equal rather? Yeah. So you talk, that's the substantive idea. And you say that uh, it's also provided for in, um, you can find it in, Article 54.1. And um, in the book, I mentioned the fact that uh, there was that concern in the drafting, in the drafting uh, documents of the constitution. So the committee of experts was saying, okay, there was that uh, questioning of why do, should we have part three in this constitution, which talks about various groups and what rights apply to them. Yet we have article 50, uh, 27, which talks about equality. But then uh, there was that understanding that this are so, you know, this is so important because there's so much discrimination against this group. There's so much disadvantage that they face that we really need to address each and every group, meet them and uh, say what the concern provides for each and every group because of the history and the context. So yes, they are, you can, and you find in most of the cases, they argue both, uh, yes, perhaps Article 27 and uh, another Article 54, or Article 27, and uh, if it relates to the youth, um, the article uh, 56 that re relates to 50, uh, from article 54 to uh, 57 discuss youth, marginalized groups, uh, persons with disabilities and the elderly. So you'd find that they, they use both, yeah? So it's just an added emphasis to show the need. And then also presumption of unfairness, article uh, 27.4. So we discussed this, I dis uh, this was, uh, you, you say that uh, at 27.4, uh, for those who uh, might not have it before them, provides for um, non-discrimination on the basis of um, various grounds, including, now it lists the various grounds, and that including has been interpreted, so including sex, gender, uh, uh, pregnancy, uh, and so on. Okay, not in those words that I've said it, but basically lists uh, some of the grounds. And it hasn't been uh, in the, the constitution. It says that where it says including, it means that the list is not com uh, conclusive, that other grounds can be added. So the challenge, yes, uh, so, so uh, the, the challenge now um, becomes then what happens 
with regards to um, sorry, um, what what happens with regards to other grounds that are not listed there? Okay, so that's that well, that's what uh, when you see look, look at cases. So he who alleges must prove. Okay, and uh, when when you have a ground and you're saying okay, it's I was in like some of the cases that I've looked at. Oh, I was pregnant and I was uh, ended up being not being provided for insurance. I ended up later on to be fired because of I had to take maternity leave and so on. It's very clear. Okay, there's uh, that concern provides for non discrimination on the basis of the grounds that are being argued for. But in some of the cases, for instance, uh, when you look at some of the cases on transgender, uh, like the Audrey Bogwa case that I referred to in the in chapter four, uh, the chapter on the grounds. Okay, so uh, it doesn't. There's no ground on on that. Okay, yes, you can maybe latch it on to uh, sex, but you find that th there's that just you have to say why it's so wrong for you not to be allowed to be given new certificates, educational certificates based on uh, on your uh, mentioning your new name, okay, or changing the gender part. So you 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 find that okay, so uh, then this person has to prove. That they've actually uh, been discriminated by this act. So basically, that means that uh, from the practice, they, they, there's no presumption of unfairness. And you find that they latch on their arguments to human dignity, to the immutability aspect of it all, and so on. So for me, it was a, a more of a, it's a difficulty. It's easier. And uh, yes, we agree that you, do, you wouldn't need to do all of that. But uh, from the approaches of uh, the cases that I see, uh, that, I've, uh, that I've discussed, the arguments are easier made. It's not a high threshold. Okay, and then uh, let me quickly just finalize on that and then open it up for other questions. So let me go to Alicia's, uh, then come back. Yeah, so Victoria, the idea about, just, just to mention to you, we yeah. exactly, if you could just maybe in another two minutes or so, and, and then we will we'll open up to some other questions. Okay, okay. wonderful, that, that sounds great. So with regards to um, Alicia's comments about um, the, poor, the poor are not being included as a ground for non-discrimination, especially with the dire poverty in Kenya. And I discuss in the, the book has a lot, a lot of discussion about what affects the poor. And we're seeing uh, that uh, sometimes uh, what I've realized is um, while working on the on, on equality is sometimes you have to check your privilege or you have to check your biases because uh, you find that uh, right now uh, Elisha uh, Ongoya would uh, would know that there's been uh, there was an attempt to change uh, the elections act to say that uh, persons mem uh, mem membership to the county assembly okay so members of county assembly should have degrees okay so the having of degrees only applies to uh, those vying for the presidential uh, seat, the county governor seat, um, and, and I think also member of parliament seat. It doesn't apply to the rest. Or I think member of parliament, should not really, oh, no, no, it doesn't apply to member of parliament. Um, so you only need to have uh, your high school or secondary school certificate and a course that you've done for maybe three months or more, a certificate. So now there the, 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 was that bid too, now change that and say that you actually need a degree. So that then for me, it was, it was a, many of the people at the grassroots levels, level who are members of the county assembly actually are common people who might not even have afforded to go to the university. So you see that that is kind of like an elitist ideology and discrimination with regards to poverty. Poverty, meaning that you are not able to afford to, okay, if we assume that uh, for the bulk of the people would not be able to afford to go to secondary school or for some reason that may, might be or most likely is associated to poverty, they are not able to attend. So you find that uh, poverty is quite key, uh, even in the chapters on socioeconomic rights. And the, but what I emphasize is we have to have a, an equality lens in looking at rights, but socioeconomic rights. And in that situation, I was thinking also this political right to be uh, to participate as well. Yes, so I agree with you, Elisha. And I talk about it a lot. And then I also agree with the incremental approach. And then just my one minute, I would just dedicate it to the limits of affirmative action to redress inequality. Uh, yes, 
yes, and basically to some extent. Because when we see uh, members of the county assembly, there has to be, to, the 2000 rule has been uh, implemented with regards to county assemblies. You find that uh, not more than, uh, than two thirds should be men and the, a third should be women. And you find that this then, if, if you look at the society, those people who've been uh, appointed as members of the county assembly, they earn a salary. So you're creating employment. And also with regards to um, article 232 of the constitution, it says that uh, every public appointment has to take into account inclusivity. Yes, uh, yes, there has to be merit, but you also have to think about those people who are appointed have women representation, have um, ethnic people from uh, all me members of other ethnic groups, persons with disabilities, and uh, also consider regional balance. So, and there are so many cases about that. And even in my appointment um, in the public, in the university, which is a public institution, I have, to, I have to say which ethnicity I belong. They had to consider that and you see uh, there being the Public Service Commission also checking public institutions and representations and so on. So you see that it provides opportunity and it opens up, uh, it opens up uh, many things. And of course, there has to be um, gender mainstreaming, but because the whole idea about the chapter on culture, religion, and gender equality is the fact that uh, society, okay, uh, women has, have been, for instance, women have been gendered to think that, oh, women can only be nurses, they cannot be doctors, women cannot be politicians, women cannot own land, and so on. And I, I, I present this and, and I say that, uh, yes, providing opportunities that they can feel is good, but there's need for gender mainstreaming and whatnot. So definitely there are needs. Okay, so thank you. I open it up to other questions and comments. Right, thank you, Victoria. Uh, we, uh, it not, uh, please, uh, it, it, there is an opportunity for others to um, contribute. Uh, I saw Tarun has, uh, uh, that was just a reaction. Uh, I have a question from Professor O'Regan and it actually relates to one of mine, uh, Victoria, which uh, mine is slightly, on a slightly different issue. And she's asked um, about the tension between equality and customary law. You've got a chapter where you deal with this and particularly the case Agnes Ombuna versus Virisira Ombuna, uh, where the court struck down the practice of woman to woman marriage under Gusi customary law. This is, this is very fascinating to me because it's it's in a sense, there's a sort of same sex marriage concept, but it takes place within the concept of a of, of in some ways a uh, woman uh, in a sense marrying another woman in order to have a male child right uh, uh, with with her husband right so uh, it, it's it's kind of regressive but it has complex cultural dimensions in in this way and um professor o'regan has asked about how the principle of transformative equality might influence a court's approach to remedies in cases where there is a conflict between custom and equality? How should courts in a way deal with uh, providing remedies in that area? So, so that's one question and I'm gonna tag another one along, uh, Victoria, to that. Um, Nomfundo did mention briefly that um, actually, you know, the South African constitution expressly recognized that equality applies horizontally. And a lot of my work is, is, is on the relationship between private parties and individuals in relation to one another and I imagine there is a similar issue in Kenya about the deformation of the private realm as well. Um, your book doesn't deal with that in much depth but you do mention for example at one point about female genital mutilation a very interesting discussion about that and you suggest that there should be alternative rites of passage that should be developed right um, as a kind of less restrictive alternative um, where women are not disabled, for example, from getting married, but some kind of culturally sanctioned practice is developed. And I had that question kind of whose duty is that? Is it the state that can develop that? Is it the, is it the cultural communities? And how does a court give effect to that in some way, right? Is there an obligation in a sense to, uh, in, in the community itself, to engage about how to address uh, uh, the, 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 and, and create an alternative. Can can courts impose such a uh, such an obligation, for instance, which could try and generate social change within the community itself, uh, rather than impose something 
on the community which may not be that successful. And there is some interesting writing in South Africa about where courts have imposed on communities and sometimes there have been some successes, but also there's some question about whether how successful that has been. So perhaps you can look at, at those two questions relating to custom, religion and equality. Okay, um, so the chapter on uh, culture, religion, and equality was was quite interesting to work on because um, I interact a lot with the with the, obviously Kenya is a a, really, a deeply religious country though sometimes it can be a bit hypocritical. <laughs> okay, so you find that um, there's so many. As I start by saying that uh, eighty five percent of Kenyans are religious. And also with regards to religion, I show the relationship between culture and religion in Kenya and how they intertwine and so on. So with regards to the tensions of culture and equality, you find that, um, and for instance, how can courts deal with that in terms of the remedies that they develop uh, in certain situations? So um, I could mention uh, with regards to this question, two scenarios. So the first one is with regards to polygamy. Uh, and there was a case that uh, stated that uh, polygamy was against gender equality. It was before Justice Mumbi Gugi. Um, and uh, the case sought to um, basically, uh, one of the things it sought to do was to a declaration that polygamy is uh, unconstitutionally legal and so on. Yes. But then uh, with regards to looking at the arguments, Justice Mumbi, Mumbi Gugi thought about, okay, so what would be the consequence of saying that uh, polygamy is, uh, that is illegal. It would mean that uh, actually in Kenya, there's so many uh, marriages that are polygamous. So you'd, it would mean that only one wife could claim or one family, or one, okay, the children are all legitimate. So they would be entitled to inherit as per Article 53 of the Kenyan constitution. But what about the spouses? It would mean that only one could inherit. So it would lead to a sort of, a sort of uh, new injustice that you're creating. So with regards to that, uh, there was that understanding about um, the, the actual reality and the context uh, in which uh, people live in. And also like with regards to the aspect of, I discussed the aspects of consent and the right of exit and so on. So was it, was the entry into, entry into polygamous marriages, uh, is it consensual or not? And uh, are there, obviously there, there's that aspect of unequal power relations sometimes or societal uh, pressures and so on. So I look at all of that and I say that uh, I, with regards to in that case, uh, the remedy, okay, in, in terms of the decision, eventual decision was that it, it would still apply because of the context and the fact that it would lead to a, an inequality in itself or an unfairness with regards to the other wives um, who, followed the, who followed after the first wife. So, um, you create a problem by solving one. So that's why we were talking about, for me, that would lead to the limits of equality. Because sometimes I talk, and, and I talk about, I discuss that at length in uh, chapter six on uh, gender, culture, and, and uh, gender equality, culture, and religion. And I say that uh, as much as there's a de facto, there's a de jure law, there's the, what is on the black letter law, what happens in, in reality is, especially in, in interior areas, is something that uh, the law has not been able to reach. And I totally agree about that issue of gender mainstreaming and that issue about what you mentioned, there needs to be more sensitization and so on. So perhaps uh, five years from now, 10 years from now, there would be a different understanding and uh, a different practice. And ba basically we'll have to confront more about whether it's right or wrong. But uh, for now there's that, if you eliminate it, then you're leaving behind or disadvantaging so many other people. So that's why I said, there's a right to exit. You can choose to, in the Kenyan constitution, you can choose to exit and a, di a different regime would apply to you that uh, is very formalistic and so on. And uh, also there's a need to realize, there's also the aspect, I discussed the aspects of personal autonomy and so on. So you can see in that case, uh, that how that arose. And then uh, let's now discuss about the aspect of, um, with regards to, let me see, FGM, uh, horizontal application of equality 
Okay, so uh, and, uh, in terms of uh, the judiciary, okay, actually there was an interesting recent case of FGM, a doctor, a female doctor had brought a case saying that the Female Genital, Genital Mutilation Act was unconstitutional because it went against the right of women to choose to uh, undergo the cut. Yes, so it was quite unique. Um, and I remember at that time that the lawyer support uh, representing the lady was my, my lecturer at the Kenya School of Law. So it was quite interesting. And however, the court uh, said that uh, it looked at the various aspects of SGM. And as I look in the, I, I discuss in the book, uh, the various, the proportionality aspects as they apply as per the limitations clause, saying how can you limit a right to choose? Okay, so you look at the nature of the right and talking, looking at the nature of FGM, uh, looking at its effects, if they're less restrictive means, and that's what you're mentioning, there are indeed less restrictive means. Um, and, uh, but then you're saying that, uh, and, and also the question arises that many women then run away from home to secretly go and undergo the cut because in such communities where FGM is predominant, um, they cannot be married if they haven't undergone the FGM. So there's that kind of pressure to undergo FGM. So obviously, for sure, there are many organizations that are working on sensitization, but it needs to be more done more, because also with regards to my uh, what I'd like to work on uh, based on my research, um, I know I don't know if uh, James Gardner is, is here. He was he had joined us on action for justice, basically looking at what happens on the ground. You realize that there's need. Uh, many of the organizations don't go to the rural rural areas because they don't have the capacity. Yeah, so there's that need for also the, the judiciary to be involved uh, in that sensitization as well, and in a language that the people can understand, not going and saying, oh, Article 27, or um, explaining it in a language that people understand and uh, saying that this um, essentially is their right. Yes. Thanks very much, Victoria. They, these are very difficult issues of how to bring about social change in a very uh, very, very harmful practices. I see uh, uh, two of our panelists have their hands up. So uh, in the absence of any other questions, I'm going to give them a, ch uh, a chance to engage with you further. Nomfundo, you first. Go ahead and then Tarunad. Um, I was going to engage you in affirmative action, but I, I've decided not to because you have agreed to write the book. So... <laughs> Uh, instead, I'm going to ask about uh, the socioeconomic rights chapters, and I think we've we've written uh, something together on this, and, and it really drew from your research on uh, equality being used as a prioritization principle in allocating resources. And I'm just keen to hear like some reflections on COVID-19, its impact on. Um, socioeconomic rights, but specifically the ways in which I think we observed the failure of national governments to really think through how to prioritize resources, um, how to be inclusive in policy and legislation in response to the pandemic, uh, using sort of um, equality principles. And so I'm keen to hear your reflections on, on some of what you're seeing in Kenya at the moment, because I think your book has built the infrastructure for an approach that would have actually allowed for an equality sense of policy and legislative response and executive response uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic, but we didn't really see this. Um, so I'm, quite, I'm keen to hear your thoughts on this a bit more. Thank you, Nomfundo. Uh, I, I'm gonna tag on there before I give on to Tarun, uh, just a conceptual issue, Victoria. You, 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 you in a sense, in your dealing with uh, equality in the context of socioeconomic rights, you, in a sense, you, you don't talk about what's generally regarded as the equality approach, which is in a sense where a group is excluded and they therefore claim that they have a right to be included in a program, right? Um, I imagine you would, obviously your approach would, would recognize that inclusion, but in fact, the way in which you capture equality is you, you see equality as a form of priority to the most vulnerable, right? It, it, it's a form of often philosophies called prioritarianism, like priority to the most vulnerable. And um, I just wondered about your, your thinking about that. And, and also, how do you distinguish who's most vulnerable? This is raised in South Africa, been, been a kind of a really serious problem because uh, there is so much vulnerability. And it, it does kind of raise the question that I think Norm Funda raised earlier. How do we 
do, do you think we need to prioritize amongst those who are poor or should we treat the poor as, as a general category, for example? Okay, so, and Tarun up, and then we, we'll give you a chance to respond. Thanks very much, David. Uh, so, Victoria, this is a question motivated by uh, Nymphando's comment about uh, the colonial context, which, um, um, which I know is peripheral. Uh, well, it's relevant to this project, obviously, but, uh, but not quite central. And maybe this is anticipating your next, many of your, one of your many next books. <laughs> is um, I would love to know um, what is the contribution of the Kenyan con constitution in, or what you think might be the might have been the con contribution of the Kenyan constitution to constitutional thought and scholarship more generally. So rather than thinking just derivatively about what South African idea or what American idea or what you know came from, the question of what can the world learn from Kenya? And the reason I asked that question is, you know, on. <laughs> On Twitter, you might have seen this already. Uh, I was quite aghast, I must confess, to see the Kenyan court just admitting an amicus petition from five foreign uh, international experts, you know, law professors in the US, Australia, et cetera, right? uh, Israel. Um, and, and I'm thinking, you know, what, what stops an American right-wing group from intervening in the next case now? Uh, so there's a colonial dimension to sort of, there's an international politics of colonialism, but also the you know, the post-colonial discourse uh, has also come out from the metropole and it's interested in cleaning up the metropole, uh, the remnants of colonialism in, in the US and Europe primarily, right? But, but I'm interested in theory building from the, from the bottom, from the global south, because so much of post-colonialism, the agenda is, even within the post-colonial discourse, the agenda is set by the global north. It's not being set by the south, and I don't know whether it matters to the south uh, in material terms. Right? So I'm just, I'm just really curious about what, what does the world learn from Kenya? Great. Over to you, Victoria. Then we're going to have just a, a very short uh, final comments by any other panelists. So uh, uh, just uh, as you say, you won't probably be able to deal with all those questions, but go ahead. <laughs> Okay, um, so first of all, to start with the socioeconomic rights and the idea of prioritization. So I ground it, um, first of all, what, what uh, made me think about that. So basically, as I said, most of uh, the things that I do, um, oh, okay, the, the work that I do in the book is grounded in uh, definitely books, research and whatnot. Obviously, uh, on socioeconomic rights, uh, obviously, David is such an authority and I refer to his books and articles as well. Um, and as um, uh, Tarun has mentioned, also the Brazilian uh, scholarship uh, from Perez and so on. Um, so, but uh, mainly, um, as I as I basically also tying to Tarun's question, what is really Kenyan? So I wanted to make it really Kenyan. And as you can see, I say that as much as there's these uh, discussions, and I explain the idea of the, the idea of basically generally having a minimum core. Uh, has been discussed a lot, and I don't want to rehash that because so many people have said that. So what is dis different about the Kenyan context? What is different about the application of uh, such in, in Kenya? So you find that uh, then article, I then go to the constitution itself, article 25b uh, talks about the allocation, in the allocation of resources to meet socioeconomic rights. Um, there should be, the state shall give priority uh, to ensuring the widest possible enjoyment with regards to the vulnerable and look at the vulnerability of particular groups or individuals, okay, including the, the vulnerable groups and individuals. So it clearly shows and talks about prioritization of the vulnerable groups and individuals. And then Article 21 goes ahead to define what are the vulnerable groups, okay, what do they include? And so then uh, responding to most of uh, both questions, I then um, look at it and say that uh, we don't even need to go to the minimum core. The constitution already directs us that uh, in meeting socioeconomic rights, there should be prioritization of um, both, there should be prioritization of uh, vulnerable groups. 
And not just that, I then go into um, Sen, Amatya Sen, about uh, development um, and the, the whole idea about uh, basically look at how, how do you conceptualize socioeconomic development rights and uh, looking at uh, poverty generally. So when we're talking about socioeconomic rights, what do they aim to do? Basically, they are aiming to meet what many vulnerable people are experiencing. People who don't have access to health, people who don't have access to housing. Most of these people are vulnerable groups. And hence why we should uh, then looking at all of uh, Nosebaum, Martha Nosebaum, Matheson and whatnot, looking at uh, their works and then now looking at it from a legal perspective, talking about minimum standards. So we should essentially before meeting to going to our aspirations as we've been talking about what we aspire as a community, as a society, as a country, first we, we have to make sure that we have those who are most vulnerable their, their, their needs are met. Before you have, you continue having state of the state of the art uh, buildings and whatnot on uh, different healthcare provision and whatnot, can people access them? Are they affordable? Um, are those buildings accessible in rural areas? Because in COVID-19, um, the context of COVID-19, as Nopolo has said, and in our book, we talk about also the, the beds, hospital beds are not available in most of the rural areas to meet the growing need brought about by COVID-19. So this actually shows us the deep inequalities. COVID-19, uh, one of the things it has done, it, there's lots of negatives, but it has shown us what that priority really matters because uh, we are leaving behind a lot of people who need that. So prioritization is actually in the constitution and that's unique to Kenya. And then also going to the whole question about um, regarding constitutional thought um, that is Kenyan. So as I've said, there's that idea of prioritization that is not grounded on the minimum core and so on, that in provision of socioeconomic rights, there should, the rights, there should be that kind of prioritization. And I discussed that, what would it look like in reality if there's no case? Because as I mentioned, there's, a problem, there's lots of problems with access to justice. So I say, okay, uh, then what should happen? This, this should be what the state is focusing on and it should be adopted in policies and whatnot. And uh, I hope that kind of thought will grow as well. And uh, also like uh, something that is also Kenyan is the idea of the two thirds gender rule. Um, and uh, I, 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 there was also a question about, does it also apply to men? So the, the way that two thirds, two thirds gender rule is framed is that uh, basically you can uh, have it as applying to either women or men. So basically that that is unique and that's a, an addition. And then also the uh, idea of the minimum core, uh, no, not a uh, minimum core, but the genuine need that affirmative action should apply to those who are genuinely in need. And uh, the scholarship by Christina Murray who was uh, my examiner and talks about what it means in Kenya. And I also discuss what it means in the context of different issues, genuine need, uh, people who are genuinely in need, is it social need, is it material need, and so on. So that's all. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Victoria. I see we have reached our limit in terms of time. There is so much to discuss. And I had hoped to give each of the panelists though another short opportunity, but I don't think we have the time for that. So I just want to thank everyone who has attended. Uh, you do see the link in your um, in, in the chat for to be able to get the book, uh, the Bonavero programs has put it there for you. Please click on it. You can get a 20% discount on the book. It is well worth your time to read it. As you have heard, it is worth your engagement. Thank you to Victoria. Thank you to the panelists. Really appreciated your expertise and input. We will hopefully, uh, uh, the, the Institute I direct is launching a new blog on African law called African Law Matters. And we hopefully will have a symposium about uh, Victoria's book as well. So please look out for that. And congratulations, Victoria, on that to your supervisor, Professor Fredman, who um, I saw was here earlier as well. And uh, thank you to the um, Bonavera Institute and uh, the staff as well as SIFAC. Uh, and I hope this will encourage greater engagement with the Kenyan jurisdiction 
Uh, and uh, as Taruna said, drawing in the discussion in Kenya into comparative jurisprudence more broadly. So thank you once again to everyone. And if you wish to express your appreciation, you obviously can. Uh, I see many people are congratulating uh, Victoria in the chat or through your jazz hands function. So with no, without further ado, thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.